Hi, this is Steve. This is Bob. This is Jay. We are Alpha Quadrant 6, a science fiction review show. And in this episode, we are talking about the stage technology used in the making of The Mandalorian. This is one of the coolest things I've seen in a long time. Well, they have a breakthrough setup that has been... Fu it's funny when I say breakthrough, components of this with their, their final setup that they ended up using to shoot season one for The Mandalorian go as far back as some of the first special effects movies ever made where they would project, you know, a scene onto a screen right. that was kind of obscured by, by background and shrubbery or whatever for King Kong, as an example, it was, it was actually, you know, a projection of, of action and Lucas in the prequel trilogy was using augmented staging uh, via blue screen. Right. So, you know, the, the actors would be on a very minimal set or no set at all with just some shapes to kind of outline where they are. And then they would fill in everything else with digital effects. But John Favreau and the group of people that that he's working with, you know, people from ILM, Disney and multiple other companies decided that they're going to do the thing that a lot of people have wanted for a long time. So this idea has really been in the works for a while, but they're the team that brought it to life. Right. And if you if you want to bottom line it, what they what they did was The Mandalorian is the very first production ever to use real time rendering and video wall in camera set extensions and effects. That's pretty much what they did. That's the bottom line. That is yeah. the, the huge breakthrough that uh, it's really it, it, I think it's a new era of, of filmmaking. Yeah, so imagine you have a set, right? The physical space that the actors are going to be in, and there may be props and situations in that part of the set, but it's surrounded by a very tall LED screen that completely surrounds the set and is projecting the the rest of the set, right? The background. But more than that, it's not just like it's not just like a, a painting uh, or something. It actually uses the Unreal Engine software uh, to create a three-dimensional set that's you know that's displayed on the LED, the huge LED monitor, so that as the camera moves, it actually gives you that three-dimensional effect. There's you know there's parallax of things that's parallax. farther in the background so you're filming three-dimensionally even though you're filming a flat led screen that's i think the real the real breakthrough here so for a quick and dirty what parallax is if you hold out hold out your hand and look at your extended finger with one eye and then close it open the other eye you'll see your you'll see your finger shift it will shift in front of the background. Yeah. That's parallax. And when you see that in, in, in a movie, when, when you, the camera is moving in a set like they had on The Mandalorian, it comes to life. It really, the immersion level just amps up all the way and you are in that environment and it's and you don't even think, you don't even think, it doesn't even occur to you that everything, that you, mo much of what you're seeing in the mid-ground and background is completely fake. And I watched how many episodes? Was it 10 episodes, 8 to 10 episodes? Never had an inkling that what we were looking at were, were LED screens and ceilings and ceiling and mm -hmm. the, the semicircular wall 20 feet high, um, maybe 10, 15, 20 feet away is this thing that you don't even know is there. And it just looks like the, the far distance and the mid distance. Amazing, really amazing stuff. It's an important note, though, to to for the audience to understand if you if this is the first time you're hearing about it, that the LED in the round, you know, when you think about the the sound stage is basically a big circle of a gigantic seventy foot tall computer screens. That that imagery that comes off of those LED screens actually is filmed in camera with the actors and is the background. Yeah, whatever the background happens to be, so it's camera worthy. That's the thing that blows my mind. It's not like a stand-in for a background that they digitize it and put in later. It is the background. It is the background. <laughs> yeah. So the the Unreal <laughs> Engine, you probably have heard of it if you're a gamer. It's it's a video game development software that allows software developers that want to make realistic looking games. But they're able to, with the latest version of Unreal Engine, make it completely realistic as far as the human eye can tell. Mm -hmm. So it is really a confluence of technologies that all were, had to be there. The LED screen had to be, have a, a, a certain resolution. 
And of course, price, you know, pricing had to come down. The Unreal Engine, uh, you know, software had to work fast enough. You know, there can't be a big delay. It had to be super fast. But the, the thing that, that blew my mind too was, was listening to John Favreau talk about the, the last couple of movies he made before The Mandalorian and how they completely influenced and gave him the ability to do this. So as an example, he did The Jungle Book. Remember The Jungle Book live yeah. action? That little kid, you know, I wondered mm -hmm. how they made it because it looked like he was in a jungle and I knew who the kid wasn't. I just knew that, of course, they didn't shoot this in a jungle. So what they were able to do, they, of course, were using blue screens for that. They didn't use green, I guess, because they wanted to stay away from the color green for obvi obvious reasons. Because, um, you know, the background color could be whatever you want. You just tell the computer, take this color as the green screen or whatever color it is, and yeah. it'll use that as the fake background. So bottom line is... He had a couple of things going on. He had minimal, minimal practical sets. He wanted some set items to be there. So when lighting was coming down, say, on the actor, it showed the proper shadows because shadows are one of the things that are very, very difficult to achieve in post-production. And the other thing that he wanted was, was reactive lighting, meaning like when a herd of elephants walk by, there's subtle lighting changes that the human eye picks up that we as humans are very used to seeing that adds to the realism of, uh, of something that we're looking at. So he would have, he had back then a big LED screen that would just have large, you know, white and black shapes going across that he later would say, okay, these will be the elephants walking by. So the lighting on the actor looked legit, really cool. And it was, you know, it definitely, you know, mm -hmm. state of the art as far as filmmaking goes. But then when they got into making the Mandalorian, their first version that they came up with was that the green screen would actually move with the camera. So there's always a green screen behind the cameras. That's a, that's a, another hurdle that they had is they have to reset the entire stage if they want to move the camera two feet to the left because they think it would look better. You don't just move the camera. The whole, everything has to shift in order to accommodate that camera move. So they thought we would have a movable you know, green screen, which I thought was a really cool idea. But then that evolved into, screw it, let's go for full LED backgrounds. And they were able to pull it off. It wasn't a small feat, guys. This was a huge deal. Yeah, um, there's, there's a couple of technical details. Uh, like the first thing I thought of was, well, I thought you couldn't film a screen because you get the more patterns. Flicker. Right? Yeah. And you get like that flickering. You ever watch like, you're watching a TV, sure. You know, in a film, like it, there's there are interference patterns basically, but they were able to digitally correct for that, so they were able to eliminate that. And then the other big thing was because again, there's a real set. In fact, like in one set, um, there's the ship, the Mandalorian ship, which is sort of built like a third of the ship physically it's exists in the set, and it's flush up against an LED projection of the rest of the ship. Right. Yeah. Yep. Seamless. So, yeah. but our the human eye is so sensitive, we would pick up subtle differences in the color. So they had to color correct the set to the LED background so that it was seamless to the human eye. So that was sort of the big post production thing. You know, was basically making that transition go away by color correcting. Yeah. Um, so. You know, if you combine that, you know, the physical set seamlessly mixing with the LED background with, you know, color corrected interference pattern is gone. And then with the Unreal Engine, it's all three dimensional. So now you just have a camera filming the LED and it, and it, it all works seamlessly. So now, you know, once you get this set up, you could basically just instantly change your sets. You know, you could be filming in one location in the morning, you hit a button. And then you get a different, you know, background for the afternoon. And you, all you have to do then is swap out the physical set, which if that's minimal, you know, then, right. you know. Or conversely, you could film a 10 hour dawn. It's mm -hmm. dawn or sunset for 10 hours. You yep. obviously can't do that in real life. That what how, that opens it up for these guys just right. to do so, so many different right. things. And I like when, if you step back even before that, Stephen, they were actually, when they were conceiving of what they were going to do, they, they realized that with this, they call this the volume, right? This is the yeah. volume, all the, the LED screen uh, wall. And they, they, they loaded it up with like co computer gener generated backgrounds and they didn't, they didn't look good. They didn't look really good at all. Um, a lot of them didn't. Uh, but when they took 
uh, when they took photo, you know, images, real images, they took pictures of a desert world and uh, and a half like a snow snowscape, and they looked at it. That looked that looked pretty good as well, but it was too distant, so distant that you couldn't get that parallax. Um, so if you if you move twenty feet over that mountain over there in the distance, was, isn't going to move because it's just right. too big and too far away. So, but then on the second to last day of their testing, they said let's do something that's more mid range, and they did these rooms. They had they they did these rooms, and then they had they they got a Mandalorian stand in with the armor, and uh, and also the armor by the way. That's why that's why they didn't want to use green or blue screens because those hues would be reflecting off of that shiny armor, and sure. that would that would have made post production a total bitch. So what they so once. So once he was there and then walking through the set, showing the parallax because because the LED screens basically know where the camera is. And when the mm -hmm. camera moves over here, the LED screens will adjust it uh, just enough to mm -hmm. give you that parallax. And when that happened, that was the eureka moment. That was the moment where everyone's like, whoa, this is totally going to work. And this is going to change film. This is going to change mm -hmm. filmmaking. Like when uh, Jurassic Park introduced CG, this is gonna this yep. is gonna be something that's gonna be duplicated everywhere. And now, imagine it, it, no green screen, no green screen. The actors n can actually see where they are, and the the directors and the producers they you know the way that it it, it improves the synergy of of creativity because having everything right there, it's just gonna we're gonna see things that never would have been created yeah. otherwise. Yeah, Carl Weathers said when they were. As an example, when they were shooting the scene, like the lava tube, when they were riding the boat on the lava. Yeah. So he, he said it was amazing because they had lighting effects to make them feel like they were moving, right? So like, you know, you know, if you like move a light over a, gr a grate, you'll see like ribbons of light kind of come and go. So they had that effect happening. And they, he said it was a, there was a moment of immersion where he really felt like he was there. Like, you know, you can almost feel like you're moving. And one comment that he said was a lot of times when actors have to work on green screens, that they have to rely on their imagination to help them understand where they are. You know, the director's telling them you're here, you see this, you're seeing that. But he was saying, you know, every actor has a different interpretation of what they're actually seeing. But he said, when you get in the in the volume, you are absolutely on the same page and you could react to the background because it is being filmed so they can react to things and, and you know, and interact mm -hmm. with the background imagery. The production team is using a technology called Previs. Did you guys hear about yep, this? Yep. Wow. They, they said the word Previs a million times in those interviews. <laughs> yeah, they did. Really big concept. So the, the quick idea behind Previs is that they'll, what they'll do is they'll put a 3D capture suit on a bunch of stand-ins and the, the director or somebody will tell them to act out a scene that literally comes right from their uh, storyboards. And then previs will allow them to render something kind of like what the movie's going to look like. So somebody's playing the Mandalorian, somebody's playing, you know, the other characters, and then they, they will act it out. The, the person that's directing them will be following the storyboards and trying to get it to match as, as good as they can figure. And then they can literally watch the movie play through. So they, they could see, does the timing work? Do the camera angles work? Are we getting yep. the, the intensity that mm -hmm. we want? Pacing, blah, blah, blah. So they have worked pre viz into their workflow. So the director, can actually get involved earlier in the production than a director would ever get involved mm -hmm. in a production. Usually the, the director's there for pre-production, but it's not like this. The director could actually talk about the flow in the story before they shoot. And the thing that's so critical about this, it's, it's like preparing for a space launch. It's so much better to spend the money before you launch than to have to deal with a critical failure after you launch, right? Mm -hmm. So they are, they are pre-gaming it to the point where when they're filming practical photography, they know exactly what they want to get. And it makes things so much faster and less expensive and less crazy. You know, they're, they don't really have to do pickups in the, that environment because they know this is the angle that we want. This is what we're exactly going for. So, and they map out the shoots that way, the, the shot that way. I just think it's a really cool thing. Like there, there's more creativity in the pipe too, because the, the more pre-production you have, the more creativity and experimenting that you can do. But is it kind of like is it kind of like you're editing before you film? Oh God, yes. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you edit it, you and it's and it's a step between storyboarding and filming, basically, where they really tweak what they're going to get. Then they then they just know exactly what they need to film. 
Well, remember when we were kids and we were watching the making of Star Wars yeah. and they would show them actually playing with Star Wars toys and they would film them like on the land speeder and you know, the yeah. camera's moving and then Luke leans over to Leia and says something to her and it was almost shot for shot what the movie was. Yeah, yeah. That's an early version of previs. You know, yeah. and this actually folds back into what animators were already doing. Animators figured this out a long time ago because they can't do right. pickups. And right. You can't they draw one cell more than you absolutely need because it's so labor intensive. Yeah. So they're yeah, yeah, they're they're laid out frame by frame. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah, they have very little on the cutting room floor for that because nothing. There's nothing on. Bright. There's no yeah. cutting room floor with exactly. Right. We we visited Pixar. They were very clear about that. There is no cutting room floor. There's no editing. It is what it is. You draw every frame of the movie, so you have to know exactly what you need going yeah. in. Dave Filoni, who is one of the incredibly talented people working with Favreau on The Mandalorian, he is an animator. And as an example, he worked on the last Airbender series. He said that the workflow of mapping every shot out and optimizing all the elements before you get to principal photography, this is nothing new to animators. Like Steve said, they were mapping it out to such a degree that they were making only what they needed. And it was funny to him that Favreau said that they have this new process that they're using because it's not new to animators. So this is all great. I mean, you know, these kind of leap forward in film technology, you know, really is important for the science fiction genre. And science fiction also has often taken the, the science and technology of filmmaking forward because it has to, you know, there were technologies that were innovated for movies like 2001, you know, a space odyssey. Uh, it's constantly sort of, Bob, you mentioned Jurassic Park and CG. Yep. So the, the, in a way, almost the story of film technology is almost told, you know, science fiction movie to science fiction movie. <laughs> right. And this is the Mandalorian is another example of that. And then of course, once the technology gets perfected and um, you know, it's, it, it's cost effective then directors and writers and you know movie makers can really start taking advantage of it. They can think about how can we exploit this technology to help us tell stories in new ways, you know? So rather than just using it to create things that we already can create in other ways, what can we create with this new technology that we can't create in the old ways? Yeah. And we haven't even seen that yet, but I think so really looking forward to see how this technology transforms, you know, the sci-fi world. It'll be really cool to see other productions start picking up the technology. Um, I don't think, I don't know how much of it is proprietary or, or if they would even hold other people back from using it. Um, you know, cause you can't stop someone from building their own studio with the screens, yeah. you know, I don't, but I, I'd, I'd love to learn about how much is really owned and if they're going to be doling it out or what they're going to do. Now, one more thing that I found out, guys, um, that that I think made The Mandalorian feel so Star Wars, you know, mm -hmm. feel so much in the in the bones of Star Wars, was that John Favreau and the team uh, didn't they? Of course, they were influenced by Lucas and the films that Lucas made, but they they wanted to be influenced by the things that influenced Lucas. Yes. So they want right. So they looked at the footage that inspired Lucas and the movies that inspired Lucas. Um, so, so they can kind of understand more of the bones of what, mm -hmm. what built Star Wars. And it, it showed itself in a lot of really fantastic ways, I think, in The Mandalorian. One, they even though we're talking about all digital uh, staging, um, they, it was a very practical oriented setup, mm -hmm. meaning, you know, they weren't using a lot of... of uh, you know, just like have a, a person that's playing a, an alien standing there with a, a green screen suit on. They they were using costuming and makeup yeah. and all that stuff. So do you guys remember the the character Cool, uh, which I always thought his name was Cool. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or Quill, the Nick but Nolte Cool character. The, yeah. Um, so that was a practical effect. Yeah, it was clearly a practical yeah. effect. Yeah. That that was a small person inside of a. A, a, a mask that had servos in it and radio everything. controlled radio yep. controlled. yeah so she would be co-doing the character with the people remote controlling the facial gestures and the voice acting and everything and they would play the 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 uh you know the voice acting during the uh, filming so everybody knew what was going on of course um that's amazing 
And also, now let's not forget this guy. Oh, you got him? No way. Let me see. Where'd you yeah, get right? it? Where'd you get we it? Or I ordered it the day it came out on Amazon. Um, this is actually a birthday present for a friend of ours, our friend the Shannon. Baby, baby. So the baby was a technological feat. Oh my God. There's the so much to say about thing the baby. to come out of that Mandalorian and a lot of great stuff came out of the Mandalorian. So they, oh my it, God. it was like five, I think it was five different people all in coordination uh, doing the movements. A guy was on the mouth and the eyes, another guy on the ears, another guy on the arms. Yeah. You know, there, there was a lot of people doing it and they got to the point where they, they were able to orchestrate their moves. And every actor really talked about the baby. Steve, did you hear about how like it was hard to get there? Like they were iterating the, the artwork for yeah. the baby. Nope, that's not it. That's not it. That's not it. They slowly started to get to this thing. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, they clicked yes. into place. Yeah. They clicked. That's it. Jay, I have the um, picture on my phone of the of the of the drawing that 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 they looked at and said, this is it. And I have it right here. And of course, I'll show it full screen, Bob. But yeah, I saw that. That's, That's the, the first image. one. That's the image that locked in. It took them three months to build him. Three months, you know, of time to build that. That's some tender, loving care. That's a long time oh, yeah. for, for such a small little prop. And he, I mean, and whoever had the idea of not going CG and going practical with the baby, I mean, that was one of, one of the better decisions that was but, made. So when is Mandalorian second season coming out? October. Wow. October really? 2020. Yep. This year. Yep. Nice. Oh yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's right around the corner. So we're going to get to see The Boys season 2. Oh. And then and then we'll see uh The Mandalorian, Mandalorian season, season two. 2. All right, so we are definitely going to keep an eye on this technology and maybe we'll talk about other uh projects, movies, series in which it's used and we'll see how it evolves, but this is pretty exciting. So guys, if you like this show, please go to alpha quadrant and the number 6.com. You can go there to, to check out all of our other YouTube videos. We have a ton of videos up. Uh, we are rolling out this slowly as a podcast as well. You can also go to patreon.com forward slash alpha quadrant and the number six if you want to help support the show and keep things rolling for us. We will see you in season two Mandalorian in October. Mm -hmm.